Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically about the new survivor just hitting the game in the Hour of the Witch release this mid-chapter, Michaela Reed. When they announced that Pinhead would be arriving on his own in the Hellraiser chapter, we basically all knew that a survivor would be coming in the mid-chapter to introduce behaviour's new mechanic for survivor perks the long-awaited Boon Totems. And suffice to say, the reactions to the new perks and the character who brought them have been... mixed. Boons seem to be extremely polarising, with many players applauding them as alternatives to the meta-survivor perks that we've had for ages, but many others, including myself, are worried about the critical density of healing perks, and immense strength of healing in general in Dead by Daylight and are concerned that Circle of Healing only adds to a problem that's been simmering for quite some time. While Michaela herself isn't quite as divisive as her perks, I've seen reactions ranging from simping to seething, and I'll be honest, I think I can understand both perspectives, because Michaela is very different from the survivors we've been getting in the last couple of years, and that's both a good and bad thing. But it's not even like good or bad mixed together, at least to me, it's quite clear where the good and bad bits are, like oil floating on water in a glass. Every good character in DBD has some sort of clear identity, and it's very clear what behaviour intends for Michaela's identity to be. They want Michaela to be their witchy girl. That's what the boon totems are, that's how she dresses, hell that's the name of the update that she's coming with. But if you ask me, Michaela doesn't really work very well as the witchy survivor. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying she's badly written, on the contrary, I think she's written far too well to fit that role. The identity of the witch is completely wasted on Michaela, and a much more interesting side to her character is pushed aside as a result. Her life as a young, aspiring writer trying to get her life together. Michaela Reed's got an identity crisis, but why? Why doesn't the witch angle work, and why does she work so much better as a horror writer instead? Let's find out. Today we're going to take a look into her new testament of lore to answer the question, what's up with Michaela Reed? But before we answer this burning question, if you'd like to get your Amazon Prime or Netflix subscription for free, then listen up, because this is going to be good. I'd like to talk to you for a second about Honey Game, a web app that allows you to monetize your access internet connection and make some extra cash with no input needed on your part. All you have to do is download Honeygain onto your device for free and let the app run in the background as you go about your daily business. Honeygain takes it from there. Any internet connection you have lying around will be used to help Honeygain's partners by doing things like running Google searches to test search optimization for those partners. They pay Honeygain and Honeygain pays you. All Honeygain uses is your connection. It doesn't have access to any of the personal data stored on the device or the network. You're not exactly going to be paying a cost of living off Honeygain's passive income, but if you fancy your monthly Netflix or Amazon Prime subscription for free, or want some spare cash to subscribe to your favourite streamer once in a while, Honeygain will cover that very nicely. For no effort on your part beyond just setting it up, it'd be kind of silly not to at least try Honeygain out. If you sign up to Honeygain with the link in the description, or use promo code PIXEL during the sign up process, you get $5 towards your first $20 payout. Download the Honeygain app now, or sign up with the affiliate link in the description. And without further ado, back to Michaela. I'm just going to give a quick bit of background about who Michaela is for a moment. Her lore is incredibly long, I don't think I can really expect you all to read it in its entirety. So I'm going to give a brief summary before moving forward. Michaela Reed is a young English woman who works at the Moonstone Coffee Shop an eccentric coffee shop at the artsy end of town. She's a barista who got involved in witchcraft in her spare time, concocting blessings and poultices to do natural ingredients which she also uses to make products like body butters, soaps and skin lotions. This isn't really elaborated on anywhere else in the story, but it's the witchiest thing she does, so let's just put a pin in it here before we go on. Since the death of her father when she was 16, she used storytelling as an outlet to deal with her grief, and found herself drawn to tales of horror and things that go bump in the night. Every Halloween, she fully embraced the spirit of the holiday, as she told those stories to her friends as a source of escapism. 
until one year her friend Julian booked her into the Endless Halloween Festival, a live performance where local storytellers share their scary stories. But in the run-up to the festival, Michaela started receiving visitations in her dreams, nightmares that all took the same form night after night. A dark figure carrying her into a rancid basement and shoving a meat hook through her shoulder before leaving her hung on it. Jeez, I wonder where she got that from. In any case, we know this is the involvement of the entity reaching out to her, but Michaela wasn't quite out of action yet. She had Julian watch over her in her sleep to make sure anything that came after her in the night was caught on camera. But after a struggle with what we could only assume to be a tentacle of the entity, Julian was whisked away and the camera's footage removed. When the Endless Halloween Festival arrived, Michaela took to the stage alone, and as she told her story, the air seemed to almost come alive with energy, but not in a good way, and just as she finished, a dark fog descended upon Michaela, and she was gone. The entity had claimed Michaela Reed, and here we are. Okay, so now it's out of the way, I'm going to start by making a bold claim. A Halloween costume style which doesn't really work in DVD. I don't think it ever could. A voodoo style shaman type witch? That works, after all we already have one. Or perhaps a more middle ages style take on a witch, as a cursed worshipper of some dark higher power. That would really work too. The Twins Law touches on it, and the existence of the Black Veil as a cult that worships the Entity is a very natural fit into the world of DVD, while entertaining concepts that align closely with real life witchcraft. And even something a bit more outlandish, like the Roald Dahl style modern witches, who turn children into rats, poultry, and occasionally modern art, would fit into DVD because there's a level of genuine threat inherent to the use of magic. It's an alien force that we don't understand. So to take witchcraft seriously, there has to be an element of the potential threat of the unknown, especially in a work of horror media like Dead by Daylight. But I don't think we can take Michaela and her witchery very seriously, because in many ways she's kind of a laughable character. For want of a better word, Michaela Reed makes me cringe. Not the writing, but Michaela as a person in her story makes me want to shut my eyes and clench my fingers, because at least in the first third of her story, it isn't possible to take much of her antics seriously. She feels like a parody of herself. You take one look at her and go, well, she looks like a barista who works in a weird indie coffee shop, where they serve overpriced kale muffins on wooden plates, and who lights weird incenses in her room to ward off evil spirits. And she absolutely is and absolutely does all of those things. She fits the student-y, hipster, middle-class white girl stereotype so perfectly and so completely, it's impossible to take her seriously. I didn't realise this until my more zoomery friends pointed this out to me, but Michaela is a TikTok witch. She blesses the coffee beans at work, checks the grains for omens, she does palm readings. She's one step away from dunking cheap knockoff crystals in water, and saying they like to swim, or claiming she can control the weather because she waved her arms in the air and then it was a bit windy. Watching the marvel of the animal kingdom known as the TikTok witch in its natural habitat made all of my internal organs hurt at the same time, but it did give me some valuable insight into why Michaela didn't ring true for a lot of people. If you watch these people in action, you find yourself totally incapable of taking them seriously. You kind of hope there's some self-aware levity to it all, because the alternative is, well, you're looking at an absolute lunatic who has somehow cultivated an audience of like-minded absolute lunatics. Michaela is exactly the same. It's all too on the nose, it's all too much of the stereotype. Taking her seriously as a witch becomes impossible because it's so laughable. Which is actually quite nice, because Michaela's absurdity is a part of why I honestly quite like her. Whereas the witch identity suffers from Michaela being a faintly ridiculous figure, it allows her to bring something to the survivor roster that we haven't seen in a very long time. 
Michaela has broken the girl boss formula. I've said before that behaviour started to really care about the characters they were writing when Jane and the play came out. They marked milestones in both killer and survivor lore that led to really interesting characters on both sides. Jane's introduction marked the beginning of a formula that has shaped the writing of every survivor since her, in a way that isn't necessarily bad, but became repetitive over time. I call it the girl boss formula. A girl boss formula story goes like this. It follows a professional in the prime of their life, i.e. their late 20s or early 30s, starting from their youth and following them through a difficult family life and serious difficulties caused by the hostilities or misunderstandings of the rest of the world, as they rise through those difficulties to be at the top of their professional field. And every single original survivor since Jane has followed that formula. Jane, Yui, Zarina, Felix, Elodie and Yunjin. Yes, Felix is a girl boss if he wants to be. Jane grew up without her mother and had to deal with endemic racism in Hollywood. Yui fell out with her father and had to deal with endemic sexism in the racing world. Zarina lost her father in what was implied to have been a racist attack. Felix and Elodie both lost their parents at the hands of the Black Veil, and their stories are both defined by their coping mechanisms. And Yunjin grew up in poverty having to take care of her sister, and became a cutthroat executive because that's the only way society would accept her. Note that many of these names I've mentioned are survivors that I absolutely love. Elodie and Zarina are my two favourite survivors, precisely because they handle these stories flawlessly. And Yun Jin brought a dark reinterpretation of the girl boss formula to explore a character who doesn't resist what the world does to her, but instead allows it to shape her into someone heartless just to survive. The girl boss formula is not a bad thing, and it does not tend to create bad stories. But when six survivors in a row all tell fundamentally the same story, it cheapens the importance and the weight of each individual story. It becomes harder and harder to care about a new character when they're surrounded by other characters who largely have the same backstory as them. That's why I love what Michaela has to offer, because for the first time in a long time, we have a survivor who doesn't have it all together yet. Michaela still has aspirations she hasn't achieved yet, which puts us as readers into a position where we can root for Michaela and want her to succeed. She's not a professional in her field yet. She still hasn't gotten her feet off the ground, working a dead-end job as she tries to make opportunities for herself, and I can't help but admire that. And the reason that works, despite the witch identity not really working for her, is her identity as an aspiring writer. It tells a far more compelling and believable story, which ties more completely into her lore. Because for most of Michaela's story, she doesn't really do anything witchy. The whole thing where she talks about wanting to make body butters and whatnot, that's really the closest we get, and it's almost never brought up in the story again. What is brought up over and over though, is Michaela's ambition as a storyteller. Her love of stories garnishes her lore from start to finish, and if you ask me, Michaela wants to abandon the gimmicky witch identity and stop being the young mystic in favour of becoming the aspiring storyteller. And you can tell that this theme should have been the focal point of her story if you look at how much narrative real estate the idea takes up. If you remove all the references to Michaela doing witchy things, lighting incenses, blessing coffee beans, the whole body butter business, you'll realise that nothing really changes. The loose structure of the story is unchanged, and, and every meaningful event in the story can still take place, because the identity of the witch is so weak. But if you remove all the references to her storytelling, you basically lose over a third of the story, including the entire ending because her love of writing and telling stories defines her character far more. Without it, Michaela's character does not make sense. And honestly, her being kind of cringy doesn't hurt this characterization. If anything, it legitimizes it. Because I say this as someone who was a young aspiring writer myself, and to some degree still is. Young aspiring writers are painfully cringy because they all think they're going to be the next Mary Shelley just because they 
feel a lot of emotions and know some long words. I've been forced to read through so many rehashes of the same 40 page cottage core sapphic adventures in weird Nordic forests and university creative writing workshops that I know young writers who haven't gotten their craft down yet often don't realise they still have a way to go, and Michaela being a slightly absurd character really helps sell that notion. That's why, despite my issues with her, I really do like Michaela. She's still yet to make the big impact on the world that she clearly wants to make. She hasn't gotten what she wants yet. But her good intentions and humble background make us want to see her succeed and find her place in the world. I just wish Behaviour would have realised a good thing that was right in front of them. Michaela doesn't need to be a witch to be a good character. The components to make her unique and interesting functioned well without it and it just distracts from the character that Michaela clearly wants to be, a storyteller. If her aspirations are to tell great stories, then Julian becomes a much more relevant part of that story because he supports and enables his aspirations, which increases the emotional impact of the ent entity abducting him and giving us even more reason to support Michaela. By taking Julian away, the entity isn't just pilfering a random guy a means to an end, but actively denying Michaela what she wants. That's an actual, very personal conflict between Michaela and the entity that would have been a fantastic angle to tackle in her story, similar to Felix and Etherdy in a way. But since Michaela is even more of an underdog due to her youth and inexperience, we could get the chance to see her grow and develop into the hero she always had the potential to be. Behaviour's insistence that we take the witch identity seriously is the biggest roadblock to this. It was clearly forced onto her to make Boon Totems fit thematically, and it shows in how the witchy elements of her character just don't work in tandem with the rest of it. If the witch identity was caught integrating Boon Totems into the survivor thematically, why did they go for Michaela, who's almost a cartoonish parody of a witch, and clearly wants to be a different kind of character altogether? instead of another character who more authentically sells the idea of a mystic crafting wars against the entity. As I've said before, witchcraft isn't anything new in DVD, and all it takes is a cursory look back into the older tomes to find a character far more naturally suited to the role of a mystic. Hadi Kaur is a character who's appeared in the Observer stories before and she'd be perfect to fit the role of a modern mystic who's got a bone to pick with the entity. I plan talking about her more in a future video about the Observer, but Hadi actually shares a lot of her general background with Michaela. As a young psychic who works with her adoptive brother Jordan to explore the supernatural until the two of them cross paths with the creation of the entity. Right up until the day Michaela was revealed, I was sure Hadi would be our solo survivor, and I was still rooting for her to come into the game. And I still believe she'd have been a better thematic fit for Boon Totems than Michaela ever was. Or if you prefer something more explicitly witchy, why not start with the witch that DBD already has, and has had for years? I've made my distaste for the Hag's lore completely apparent on several occasions, and Behaviour's desire to revisit how DBD presents witchcraft provided the perfect opportunity to revamp Lisa's lore by tying it in with the new survivor. Lisa's grandmother is a character who exists in both the hag's base lore and her tome, and Lisa's interactions with her are hands down the best part of her tome. So what happened to her grandma when Lisa was taken? Until Elodie and Felix, the impact on someone's loved one when they were taken by the entity was rarely explored. Imagine how hard it must have been for her grandmother, worried about what had happened to Lisa, certain that she hadn't done enough to protect her, and full of guilt that she failed to safeguard her own family. If Lisa's grandmother had been the survivor for this chapter, it would have been a great opportunity to check back on what impact Lisa's disappearance had on her family, and explore the occult world she came from in greater detail. Imagine Lisa's grandmother harnessing the same magical power that her granddaughter wields to try and make a deal with the entity, offering her guilty soul up to it as payment for her granddaughter's salvation. And with no intention to repay the debt, 
the entity just takes her. And Lisa's grandmother is sentenced to wander the realms forever, seeking her granddaughter and her forgiveness for letting her come to harm. Think about it. Dead by Daylight has plenty of older men. Ash and Ace are a little past their prime, and Bill's old enough to be a Vietnam veteran. And yet we've never had a female survivor a day over 30. Imagine if, instead of a witch cosplayer who blesses coffee beans, it looks like she writes an SSW Sherlock fanfiction, we had an old black lady from the bayous, looking for redemption and forgiveness, while protecting herself and those she cares about with totems and charms passed down through the generations. But I don't think we were ever going to get a character like that, especially not as a solo survivor. Because original survivors, especially female survivors, who aren't conventionally attractive, who can't be stand or simped over, do not sell well. Look at Jeff. How many Jeffs do you see in your games? Jeff's a fucking great character. I love Jeff. He's positive masculinity in action, thematically fits with his killer, and nobody plays him because he's a big beardy bloke in a leather jacket. You really think Behaviour would take the risk of making an old black woman the star of a solo survivor release without a killer to push up the sales figures? Especially with this community difficult relationship with black survivors? Of course they wouldn't. Characters who are not conventionally attractive, especially female ones, get so much shit in this game. Look at Charlotte compared to someone like Rin or Susie. And the uh, <laughs> Nia is the entity her <laughs> jokes that everyone is still making for some reason. The punchline is basically just <laughs> Nia's ugly. <laughs> and it's really not funny, no matter how many times you say it. If you're not conventionally attractive, free or licensed, good luck getting any fans, and good luck getting any marketable cosmetics to line Behaviour's pockets. That's what Michaela is. She's marketable, she's safe, and she's likely going to sell very well as a vehicle for cosmetics in the future. I think it's fair to say that my feelings on Michaela are very mixed. I like that her story brought something different to the table, and I think the overall themes of her story are actually very good. If you look past the witchy veneer that Behaviour used to paint over her like a landlord painting over a plug socket. It's just a real shame that the concept of a witch survivor was kind of wasted on her, because Behaviour wanted to sell boon totems in a cute and marketable young package because they knew that selling an original survivor in a solo mid-chapter DLC would not be easy. The only time they tried selling a solo survivor before was Ash who had the power of being licensed, and having the absolutely giga-broken Metal of Man packaged in with the DLC. Michaela needed to sell, and so Behaviour kind of did the bare minimum to ensure that she did. There's been rumblings that the next chapter will be yet another licensed one, meaning it's entirely possible we get another solo survivor in the next mid-chapter, and I hope the DVD team learns from both the successes and the failures of Michaela in the future. If you like Michaela, then great, more power to you, and if you don't, I completely understand. But if you don't care for her, then rest assured, between this huge round of balance updates, the Trickster and Yunjin tone crescendo, and the Midnight Grove event, hopefully this coming mid-chapter will still give you more treats than tricks this Halloween. And once again, big shout out to the people at Honey Game. Be sure to check out the sign up link to Honeygain in the description, and don't forget promo code PIXEL. Helps out the channel, helps out Honeygain, and helps out you, it's really a win-win. If you enjoyed this video then please do not forget to like and subscribe, or just leave a comment about how much you hate NFTs. After how hectic these past few weeks have been with the copyright strike and the NFT business and all that sort of stuff, I want to try something a bit more relaxed next week. So I'm going to be working on something not related to DVD, or at least only related to very tangentially. I'm doing an in-depth analysis on a movie that's very close to my heart and has been for many years. Saw 2. Maybe this will uh, take my mind off all this DVD NFT business. I'm sure Saw would never do anything like that. The rules are simple. Make your choice. Oh shit.